Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. Nat Turner's gonna get ya. We're gonna dial the clock back to August 21st, 1831 and travel to Southampton County, Virginia and witness the largest slave revolt in US history. Let's take a look at the conditions that led to it, what was going on in Nat Turner's head and what are gonna be the dire consequences following his execution. So here we go guys, why don't we go giddy up for the learning and go get her done right now. Nat Turner was born on October 2nd in the year 1800 in Southampton County, Virginia. He was born in that county. He's going to die in that county. He never escaped that county. His mother was a slave brought from Africa. His father was an escaped slave when he was a young boy. His father escaped. But he was really raised by his grandmother, fiercely anti-slavery and fiercely religious. Now, while it was not illegal to teach a slave to read, it was illegal to teach a slave to write. So Nat learned how to read from one of the sons of his master, the Turner family. First, Benjamin Turner was his master, I hate that word, and then later his ownership was transferred to his brother Samuel Turner. But it was said that Nat was an extremely intelligent young boy, that he was always fasting and praying and reading the Bible. And he also, as a young boy and later into young adulthood, had visions. He interpreted these visions as being messages from God, that he was the chosen one. Um, he became a preacher amongst the slaves and some whites as well, um, reading them the Bible, giving them lessons, and really talking about anti-slavery as it was interpreted from the Bible. You have to remember that Christianity, in a sense, was used by the white culture in the antebellum South in order to pacify slaves, to keep them in their place, to show them the passages where it was said that their race was inferior to the white race. But of course, Nat Turner isn't interpreting that way. Now, when he is at the age age of 22, Nat Turner decides, I'm out of here. I'm going to go grab a backpack and hit the woods. And he does that. He escapes at the age of 22. But then he has a grand vision on his escape route that God comes to him as he sees it and tells him he needs to return, that his mission on earth is laced with slavery. And Nat Turner goes back. Um, he expands his religious teachings amongst the slaves. He was called the prophet by many of his followers, and he is on a projectile to do something great according to the way that he is interpreting things. Now, in 1828, he's going to get what he considers to be the grand version, where Christ himself shows himself to Nat Turner as he's working the fields for his new master, Joseph Travis, and he is basically given the message that he needs to do something, that there needs to be a fight between the kingdom of God and the anti-kingdom. He interprets that as fighting against slavery. So we're getting closer. We got a couple of eclipses to get through. Yeah, I said eclipses, and then we're going to have our rebellion. So why don't we go light the match and explode the barn? So by 1831, it's pretty much set that Nat Turner's going to do this rebellion, that that vision in 1821 told him what he had to do. Now, it's false to say that there weren't any other types of rebellions. There certainly were planned rebellions. Uh, Denmark Vesey was executed in South Carolina in 1822 for trying to gather thousands of slaves to revolt, but that never materialized. So Nat Turner really has a small group of trusted advisors, if you want to call them that, other slaves that he's confiding in and planning with. Um, Henry, Hark, Nelson, and Sam were four slaves that were associated with the planning of the rebellion. But then in February of 1831, there's a solar eclipse. And you have to remember, there's not a lot of scientific knowledge going on about what a solar eclipse is. So Nat Turner is going to interpret that as being a message from God to get the ball rolling. So him and his small group of slaves planned the insurrection for July 4th of 1831. I'm sure you can figure out why they would pick July 4th. Of course, it's Independence Day. They want that to be their Independence Day. But unfortunately, it's going to be held off for a few more months because Nat Turner falls ill. And then in August of 1831, there's another eclipse. But it's not just an ordinary eclipse. Thousands of miles away, Mount St. Helen had erupted and had thrown so much ash into the sky that this solar eclipse gives the sky really a weird blue-green tint. And Nat Turner believes this is a message from God telling him that you need to do this now. And they do it. August 21st, 
1831. And then rather than using muskets, they figured that would draw too much attention to themselves. This is a resurrection with knives and axes and swords, really kind of barbaric instruments in a sense. And they first attack the home of Joseph Travis, and they're going to kill everybody in it. They're going to kill Joseph. They're going to kill his wife. They're going to kill his nine-year-old son. They're going to kill a sleeping hired hand. And in fact, after the killing of the Travis family, two of the slaves return because they forgot to kill the baby in the carriage, which they ended up killing and then throwing its body in the fire. They believed it needed to be gangster in order to spark the Civil War, this freedom fight, this good versus evil battle. And then they continued for 48 hours, marching towards the county seat. Are you ready for the county seat's name? It's in Jerusalem. I kid you not. And along the way, they're ransacking houses. They're killing all of the white people. They killed 55 to 65 white people. So outside of Jerusalem, their numbers had grown. They had gathered about 75 slaves that they had freed in this insurrection fight. And as they're marching to Jerusalem, they're met by a group of over 200 militia that are mainly local militia, but there were also some federal troops from some of the ships that were docked in uh, the bay at Norwalk. So they're immediately going to be taken down. And eventually, 56 seven blacks are going to be executed amongst that group. But it's the local militias that are going to kill over 200 blacks. Most of them have nothing to do with the insurrection. It really is a vengeance killing. And it wasn't for two weeks before the leader of the militia had to basically tell people, stop killing black people, um, probably because they were property and it was seen as a loss of property. Now, all of the blacks that were killed, uh, the state actually reimbursed uh, the owners of those slaves for their property lost. There were 15 people acquitted, but 57 blacks were executed. Now, Nat Turner himself escaped. He, um, two months, was on the lam, um, and there was actually physical descriptions of him that he was five foot six to five foot seven. He was 155 pounds. He had a very bright complexion. They had uh, his scar locations. He had a scar on his head, a scar on his neck. He had a huge knot on his arm from a previous injury. But eventually, a farmer is going to see some underbrush and remove it and find Nat Turner nearly two months after the insurrection and turn him in. Now, Nat Turner is going to be executed. It took like six days to execute him. And again, just to make it more ironic, you have to remember that Nat Turner was executed in Jerusalem. And then what they did with the body is sort of a mystery. We know that his skull ended up in Gary, Indiana. But there were published reports in the Negro Journal of History in the early 1900s that Nat Turner's body was actually skinned and that they made purses of it. They made trophies out of bones and that they were handed out as heirlooms kind of to show uh, that, you know, this is what happens to people who revolt against slavery. And in fact, many of the blacks that were killed in these kind of insurrections against the insurrections had their heads put on poles. I kid you not. There's actually a stretch of the Virginia State Highway Route 658 that's called Blackhead Signpost Road to this day. So the insurrection is over, but the legacy of the insurrection is not over, as there really is a huge fear in the white community that something has to be done in order to quell these future insurrections. So why don't we quell some future insurrections? <laughs>so immediately after the insurrection there's going to be pressure put on the legislatures in these southern states to do something now virginia specifically had a rather academic debate about what to do there were forces of colonization that we should take blacks and ship them back to africa and actually the grandson of thomas jefferson thomas jefferson randolph actually argued for a gradual emancipation which fell a few votes short of actually kind of going further but it shows you that there was a debate. But the winners of the debate are going to be the slave owners who want to take that hammer and put it down on the heads of blacks to show them that this is never going to happen again. So uh, ends up being a police bill. The police bill forbid any blacks from having a jury trial, whether you were free or you were slave. Of course, you didn't have it if you were slave. And any free blacks that were convicted of a crime could be sold back into slavery. But then probably the one with the largest effect is going to be the education bills that are passed. It's now going to be a crime to teach freed blacks or slaves not only how to write, 
but how to read. And it's thought that if they could limit their education, they could limit any future Nat Turners, you know, from bubbling up to the surface. And of course, this is really going to cause abolitionists in the North to go on a crusade in order to try to get literature and education to blacks, both slaves and freed blacks, in the antebellum South. So the Nat Turner Rebellion is going to have huge re reverberations across Southern society. Now, all Southern states have, of course, their own legislatures, so there's varying bills and laws. But really, 1831 is seen as a watershed year in terms of the South taking a much harder stance to slow the education of blacks and for there of ever being another type of uprising like the Nat Turner Rebellion. So there you go, guys. Nat Turner, he was going to go get you. And at the end of the day, right before he was executed, they asked him if he had any regrets. And he said, did Christ have any regrets because he was going to be crucified? You could see that Nat Turner sees himself as a prophet, as a Christ-like figure that was brought to earth in order to spark a rebellion between forces of good and forces of evil. So you tell me, is Nat Turner a killer, a murderer? Or is he some type of hero like a John Brown that was leading us out of the wilderness. Leave it down in the comments below. We want to know what you think, of course, and we want to make sure that you check out other videos. So subscribe to Hit Pew's History. We have over 410, 20, 30 videos. There's a whole bunch. And make sure you always remember it because it's always going to be true. Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you guys next time. Bet you press my buttons.